Thankfully, the house was still pitch black and silent. Fearfully, she felt her way through the unfamiliar rooms in her nightgown and bare feet. The floor was cold underfoot. When she found the front door, she let out her breath slowly. Now, she thought, she'd open it and be back home. Please, please. Cautiously, she pulled on the door and stared out. Dawn was just beginning beyond the rim of the field. A thin strand of light spun out along the horizon between earth and sky. A rooster crowed his wake-up call into the clear air. Adieu, adieu, echoed Beck. That was when she remembered the dream. She had been at a seder, surrounded by familiar faces, and for some reason she hated being there. The sweet wine, the bitter herbs, she could almost taste them. Them. She heard her aunt's voice singing the Dianu as if from miles away. Suddenly, a terrible longing for all the people in the dream overcame her, and she moaned softly. So, you cannot sleep either, Shmuel's voice, deep and rumbling, came from the dark behind her. Getting married is the most frightening thing in the world, I think, but surely my marriage is not what kept you awake. Did you have another bad dream, Kaya? I worry about you and your dreams. A girl's dreams, like her life, should be sweet and filled with honey. She nodded slowly, then turned. She could see nothing in the black room, as if sensing that, Shmo came over to stand by her side in the doorway. He was fully dressed and smoking a pipe. The curls of smoke feathered out into the open air, spreading themselves thinner and thinner, until at last they were gone. Do you think it's strange, little Kaya, that I, Shmo Abramowitz, with an arm like a tree and, as Skittle says, a head like a stone, should be afraid of getting married? He flexed his left arm at her and grinned, but above the grin his eyes seemed troubled. Being married might be scary, Hannah agreed tentatively. Being married does not bother me, Shmuel said, but getting married, that frightens me. Not sure she understood the difference, Hannah hesitated. Maybe, she took a deep breath and hurried on. Maybe there's something everyone is afraid of. With you, it's getting married. With me, it's shots. Shots? Shots, you know, needles. She jabbed her right finger into her left arm to demonstrate. He smiled and nodded. You were very sick, I understand. Kaya was sick, not me. He continued smiling as if humoring her. Hannah drew in a deep breath and sighed. My mother is afraid of snakes, she said at last. There are not many snakes in Lublin, Shmo chuckled. I'm not from Lublin, Hannah said. I'm from New Rochelle, and I'm not Kaya, I'm Hannah. When Shmuel's eyebrows rose up and lines furrowed his brow, he looked so fierce Hannah moved back a step. Of course, she said quickly, there aren't many snakes in New Rochelle either. And Kaya is my Hebrew name, not Hannah, because of a friend of Aunt Eva's. And Lublin is a big place, I am sure, Shmuel said, scratching his head with a gathering urgency. And surely I am not familiar with every avenue and street, having been there only twice in my life. New Rochelle is not in Lublin, wherever that is, is a city on its own, Hannah cried. Since when is a street a city? Hannah could feel her voice getting louder, like Aaron's when she was scared, and a panic feeling was gripping her chest. New Rochelle is, too, a city. It's in New York. New? Suddenly remembering Gittel's boyfriend, Avram, she shouted, In America! And Krakow is in Siberia, I get it. A joke to help me forget about my marriage fears, he laughed. Lublin in America and Krakow in Siberia. Though dear Gitto would say it most certainly is that far to both of them. He reached out and patted Hannah on the head. What a strange little bird you are indeed. Who has found her way into our nest? Gitto is right. Become a little Americanizer, whose Yiddish is pure Lublinese. Let us feed Hopple and Popple and discuss world geography some other time. Lublin in America, Krakow in Siberia. He chuckled again as he held out a cloak for her and a pair of ugly black tie shoes. Seeing that he was not taking her seriously, Hannah decided there was nothing else to do but go along. She took the clothes. The ugly shoes fit perfectly, too perfectly. She shivered, then followed him out to the barn, where they fed hay to the workhorses, Popo and Hoppo, in companionable silence. Hoping for a big breakfast, Hannah was disappointed when all Gitto put on the table was a jug of milk, black coffee, and a loaf of dark bread. No cereal? Hannah asked. No donuts? No white bread for toast? White bread? So that is what one eats in Lublin. White bread is for rich folk, not for farmers, Schmoll laughed. 
But yesterday you would eat nothing, nothing at all, and today you want white bread. It is an improvement, I think, from nothing to Lublin, white bread. Ah, but then I forget, you are not from Lublin, you are from Rochelle. New Rochelle. And where is old Rochelle? Gitto asked. There isn't any, Hannah said, shaking her head. What was the point in arguing with dream people who mixed you up? Anyway, she was starving, even if it was a dream. She reached for the milk pitcher and poured herself a glass of milk, took a swallow, and choked. It tasted awful. She looked into her glass. It's got things floating in it, she said. What things? Gitto looked. There. That is not things. That is the cream. You have no cream in the milk in Lublin? Rochelle, said Schmull. New Rochelle, Hannah insisted. Old, new, what does it matter? asked Gitto. But if there is no old Rochelle, how can there be a new? Schmull mused out loud. Perhaps there is a Rochelle all alone, though the child does not know it. Pupil, Gitto said. Men love to pursue questions without answers merely for the sake of arguing. It is what they do best. Ignore him, Kaya. A rabbi he is not. Hannah nodded and, noticing Shmuel wasn't eating, tried to pass him the pitcher of milk, but he waved it away. We do not follow all the old customs, Gitto and I, alone here and so far from the village, but I think it is not bad to hold to some of the traditions like the groom's wedding fast. Gitto snorted, especially if your stomach is nervous. Me? Nervous? And what do I have to be nervous about? Shmuel winked at Hannah, as if binding her to silence. I heard you tossing and turning all night, Mr. I'm not nervous, and I heard how early you got up this morning, even before the rooster crowed, even before the spring sun. Shmuel seemed about to answer her back when there was a loud knock at the door. Hannah jumped at the unexpected knock, then a small hope suddenly warmed her. Maybe the knock was some kind of signal that the dream, the strange play, was over. Maybe it was her mother or her father or Aunt Eva standing out there. She started to rise, but Gitto got up first and went to the door. When she opened it, the door framed a man with shoulders as wide as the door itself, wiry red hair and a bushy red beard. Good morning, Yitzhak, Shmuel called out. Yitzhak greeted Shmuel in return, but he kept his eyes on Gitto, who gave him no more than a grunt in way of greeting. Have some coffee, Yitzhak. It is a long way through the forest from the shtetl to here, and even longer to Fay's village, Shmuel said, gesturing expensively with his hand. And have you heard about her little niece, Kaya? Little is what I have heard, but what you have here is no little girl. She is a young lady, Yitzhak said, grinning at her. And you are feeling better? I see a good color in your cheeks. Hannah looked down at the table, embarrassed by the butcher's compliments, and Gitto reached over in front of her and took the coffee pot up, placing it down again with a solid twack in front of Yitzhak. Taking the pot up eagerly, Yitzhak poured himself a cupful that slopped over the rim. Gitto made a small snick of annoyance between her teeth and wiped up the spill with the edge of her apron. Almost shyly, Yitzhak smiled up at her, took a deep drink of coffee, then turned slowly to Shmuel. I have two cages of chickens outside, Shmuel, my wedding gift. Should I leave them or take them to Faye's village with us? Leave them, leave them, Yitzhak, Shmuel said. With our great thanks, after all, Faye and I will be returning here for the wedding night, and she will see them then. If she sees anything but your blue eyes, then she is a fool, Gitto said. She should be counting your curls, not her gifts. We will load the chickens in the wagon with the other wedding gifts. Those snorers and Viosk will not think we do not honor our own. Shmuel laughed. Gitto and Kaya will stay the night with Faye's people and come back home in the morning. It would not do. The walls are thin. He actually blushed, and Gitto put her hand on his shoulder. Do not say it step by step in front of the child, she said. I did no such thing, Gitto. I was careful. I said only that the walls are thin. And so they are. He meant no disrespect, Yitzhak added quickly. Hush, Yitzhak the butcher. Do not tell me in my house what is and what is not. Gitto's eyes sparked. Hannah interrupted. But I know what a wedding night is. All three stared at her, and Yitzhak laughed nervously. You see, he said, I told you she was a young woman. You said a young lady, and a lady is what she is not if she knows such things, Gitto said. It's on General Hospital, Hannah began. Gitto turned to Hannah and shook her head. So in Lublin, the hospitals tell you about these things. Then I do not think much of hospitals. And I think even less of Lublin. You know so much, my little yeshiva butcher. Telling you anything more is carrying straw to Egypt. Ah! She threw her hands up in the air and spun around to face Yitzhak. And you, you finish your coffee. Look how the morning flies and we sit here gabbling about wedding nights, which will be here soon enough. 
I have still to clean the house. I will not have Faye coming here, fresh from her father's house, where there is a serving girl to clean, and think me and all in the shtetl slovens. We have to leave before noon. That is why I came early, Gitto, so I might help. My children, too. Yitzhak stood, the coffee cup still in his hand. The children, oi, and where did you leave them? Outside in cages like the chickens? She clicked her tongue and went to the door. Opening it, she waved her hand in greeting. Groovin, Subora, come in. Two little blonde-haired children, no more than three or four years old, suddenly appeared in the doorway, silently holding hands. Go, sit at the table with my niece Kaya, the young lady over there, Kito said. She will give you milk with things in it and tell you stories of places called new this and old that. Then you can go outside with her and feed the horses and chickens. The horses are fed, Shmuel said. The chickens I will tend to myself with Yitzhak and the children. Kaya can help you here in the house. There is enough to do. Yitzhak's massive hands made surprisingly dainty circles in the air. My children and I will take care of the animals. Zipporah is wonderful about collecting eggs, a real specialist, and Reuven knows just when to shoo them off the nest. He smiled down at the children who looked up at him adoringly. We are sorry if we disturbed you. We thought we could come over early and in that way help. Help, Gitto sniffed, but she smiled at the children. No sooner had Yitzhak disappeared outside with Reuven and Zipporah than Shmuel laughed out loud. I swear, Gitto, that man is already henpecked and not even married to you yet. He is a monster. Kito murmured. Imagine leaving those sweet, motherless children outside like chickens in cages. She began to swipe at the table furiously with a wet rug. I thought he was nice, Hannah ventured. Nice, Kito's voice rose. But then you know so much about raising motherless children, too, I suppose. Hannah closed her mouth. Argument was useless. Instead, she began to clear away the dishes with silent efficiency and seemed to be the only one who was surprised that she was helping.